and the waterfall there. And that's what we're looking at in this picture. So as you can see, there's a bunch of fly fishermen. This is actually a bit on the low side. There's usually way more than this. And uh, some of the salmon are actually able to get over this waterfall. I know it seems like not many do, but uh, they do find them above, above this waterfall. So anyway, an outline of um, what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna talk about the identification of our two salmon species, a little bit about their biology, their migration, and then we're gonna end it talking a little bit about fishing. So who am I? I'm uh, Rob Dragani. I'm an environmental educator at the Urban Ecology Center, like Ethan said, and then I'm also a fisheries technician with the Wisconsin DNR. And um, my role with them is carrying out our creel surveys. So I'll talk a little bit about what that is. And then last but not least, I'm a master's student at the UWM School of Freshwater Sciences. And I'm also just interested in salmon in general. I think that they're pretty interesting. So creel surveys, what the heck is that? So a creel, that is a noun for this old school wicker basket that fishermen back in the day used to throw their freshly caught fish in and then bring them home. So if you've ever seen like an old movie or cartoon, a lot of times they would have like a bunch of trout or whatever hanging out in these wicker baskets when they bring them home. So that's a creel. A creel survey would be a survey of what fish are caught and kept. So that's what I do. I go out um, to fishing spots that the DNR sends me to. I talk to fishermen. I take account of how many people are fishing, how many boat trailers are parked at boat ramps. And uh, I help fishermen identify their fish and uh, um, I also take note of the, the water conditions and what types of fish are being seen. And then I write all that up into a weekly outdoor report that you can find online. Just search uh, DNR Lake Michigan outdoor report. And I talk about what fish you can see in the harbor right now, how people are catching them, um, different things to look for. So I, uh, I carry that out for Milwaukee County. So if you ever read this stuff on there, just know that it most likely came from me. So some of the themes um, that we're gonna talk about uh, or some of the themes that I want you to keep in mind during this lecture are that salmon are introduced to the Great Lakes. So they're not native here. We don't call them invasive. Um, there's a distinction and I can get more into that if people like but they're native to the west coast of North America. And then they exhibit some parity, which means that they only have one reproductive event in their lifetime before death. And we call that spawning. They are anadromous, which means they migrate uh, upriver from the sea in order to spawn. So they spend part of their life in fresh water and part of their life in salt water. Obviously we don't have salt water here, but we'll talk about that. Um, they are ecosystem engineers for a few different reasons, and we'll get into that later. And last but not least, just in time for Halloween, they are zombies, and we will talk about what that means too. So um, these are the five species of Pacific salmon. Uh, we have three here in Lake Michigan. Does anyone know what they are? You can call it out or put it in the chat. Any guesses? You have a 60% chance of, of guessing, right? Coho, yep. And then we also have Chinook. And the last one, I'll be a little surprised if anyone gets this. Pink, yep, that is right. So um, we have the Chinook, also known as the King, the Coho, and the Pink. Now the Pink are not stocked. And they are super, super, super rare. So we're not going to talk too much about them. You don't really hear a lot about them, but I wanted to include them on here because they do exist in Lake Michigan. And uh, I also wanted to point out that these are the salmon's um, spawning colors. So I know we have a lot of birders in this audience and um, just like birds often exhibit different colors in their mating season, salmon are the same way. So you might think of salmon as like the classic like red fish right but um the king salmon that we have here in milwaukee are usually this like olive brown greenish to black color 
Um, some strains of them out west are red, but the ones we have here usually don't have a red tint. The cohos, they do have a bit of a red tint, especially the males, which is what you're seeing here, have this bright red belly. And then the pinks, um, they don't get nearly as big. And the, their identifying feature is that they have, the males have this big hump. So that's what they look like in their spawning colors. Now here's what they look like out in the lake when they're not spawning. Pretty much all the same. They're really, really, really hard to tell apart when they're like this. Um, one of the things, probably the most reliable way that we can tell them apart is by looking at their, uh, the inside of their jaw. The Chinook has more of a black mouth than the coho, whereas you see the coho has these white marks on the inside part of its gums, but the Chinook also has a little bit of white in its mouth too. So even that can be a little bit difficult to tell apart to an untrained eye. Now I wanted to compare all these salmon are Pacific salmon. So this is what they have out in like Alaska, for example. But um, people often ask me, well, what about Atlantic salmon? We have those here too, right? Well, we used to. They, the DNR stopped stocking them in Lake Michigan in 1989, but they are still stocked in Lake Huron. And sometimes a few of them will swim over from Lake Huron to Lake Michigan. And the DNR biologist told me that we see about one or two of them a year in Lake Michigan. And uh, I wanted to make the distinction between the Atlantic and Pacific salmon um, that they're in a different genus. So this Atlantic salmon are in the same genus as Salmo or as uh, brown trout, the Salmo genus. And they they are unique among salmon in that they can spawn more than one time in their life. So all these Pacific salmon die immediately after they spawn. But Atlantic salmon are capable of spawning multiple times in their life. They usually don't because spawning is such an energy intensive event that most of them only spawn once, but they are able to spawn up to three times. So all these other salmon, the Pacific ones, they die after they spawn, and they're all in this genus Ankorhynchus, which is Greek for hook snout. And uh, you'll see that here in the illustration, the males exhibit this hook snout. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And then I also wanted to compare our um, two primary salmon species, the Chinook and Coho to some of the other Salmonids that we have in Lake Michigan. So this is the Salmonidae family, which also contains uh, whitefish, chars, and graylings. Um, does anyone know of these species, which ones are native to Lake Michigan? You can throw it in the chat or call it out. That's awesome that uh, Moran answered the, the salmon questions. Hey Moran, how's it going? But um, anyway, the brook trout are, and the lake trout are two native species. So um, those ones are relatively easy to tell apart from these other four species. These other four are all, when they're out on the lake, they mostly look like silver fish with dark spots and it can be really difficult to tell them apart by their markings alone. So one trick that I use, like when I'm out doing my creel surveys and I might see a fish come up to the surface or be swimming around and I'm obviously not going to be able to open its mouth and see what its gums look like. But one thing that I can do to at least narrow it down um, between salmon and trout is to look at their tail. So you'll notice that the tail on the coho and especially the Chinook salmon is much um, larger and uh, flared out compared to the trout tail. So the brown trout and the rainbow trout, their tail is more squared off and not as big. And um, the saying is that you can tail a salmon so you can hold it in the water by its tail because its tail is so big and stiff and they use that as like a paddle to, to swim really fast. Whereas the rainbow trout and the brown trout, their tail is more flexible and not as big. And if you tried to hold them by the tail, they would just collapse it and swim out of your hand. 
So that's a good way to at least narrow it down between salmon and trout. Okay, now I also wanted to make the distinction of how different they can look um, when they're out on the lake versus when they come into spawn. So this is our, uh, one of our maintenance guys here at the UAC, Max, good friend of mine. Uh, he also knows a lot about salmon. And here's him with the king salmon that he caught out on the lake. You can tell it's nice and silver. And then here's a king salmon that I caught uh, October two years ago. So you can tell that it's a totally different color, right? So um, I also want to mention Max knows a lot about salmon, like probably even more than I do. So he's another really great resource for any Great Lakes question in general. Um, and then I also wanted to point out, you see that I'm holding the salmon by its gill here. Well, if you're going to let a salmon or trout go and you don't plan on um, taking it to eat it, you really should not hold them like that. Here is a better way to hold them. Um, so salmon are, are very, and trout are very fragile creatures. And if you hold them up by their head like that, um, they have a very uh, weak membrane that connects the head to the rest of the body. And, and you can break that membrane, which obviously would kill the fish. So um, if you want to throw them back, you're not planning on keeping them for me, don't hold them like this. I, I did keep this fish, so, um, you know, not a concern there. But uh, also try to keep them in the water as much as possible because they are fragile fish and, um, you know, we want to do our part to preserve the fish that we have here. So a uh, little species spotlight here. This is the uh, close-up of the coho salmon. They were first introduced to uh, the Great Lakes in 1966. They had been um, sporadically stocked before then, but none of it really took off. This was the first large-scale effort. Um, the state record is 26 pounds, and the peak of their run is in early to mid-November. So we're just now starting to see some of these coho come in. Then the other species is the Chinook or King salmon. They are much more common. Uh, a lot more of these are stocks than cohos. And the peak of their run, we're kind of on the tail end of their run now. So the peak of their run is like late September, early October. Um, and they get much, much bigger than the coho. It's not uncommon to see them over 20 pounds where the state record for Chinooks is 44 pounds and the state record for coho is, is 26 pounds. And a 26 pound Chinook would, would be not uncommon. Um, and a really easy way to tell them apart if you know, you're not gonna get up and look at their gums or whatever is uh, something that's pretty reliable is if you pull a salmon out of the water and it is just mean looking, it's probably a Chinook. Like that is uh, pretty reliable. Like they just, their mouth and their eyes, they just look angry. And the cohos are a little more innocent looking. So that's another good way to tell them apart. Okay, now another um, interesting thing about the salmon is that they are sexually dimorphic, which means that the males and the females look different. And this is mostly only the case when they're spawning. So when they're out on the, the big lake, and they're um, silver colored, they pretty much look the same and it's kind of hard to tell them apart. But once they start spawning, the males get this um, little downward extension on their upper jaw. We call that a kype jaw, K-Y-P-E. And this is actually a pretty mild um, appearance of it. it it's usually much more uh, profound. I mean, sometimes it's really like a long snout and it, it can be really easy to tell the males apart when they're swimming around. You'll notice that the females also get um, this big belly and that's where they keep all the eggs. So it's really easy to tell the females and males apart once you know what you're looking for when they're spawning. Another easy way to tell them apart is if you pull them out of the water and there's eggs literally shooting out of them, then it's definitely a female. It's honestly impressive how many eggs they have and the force and speed at which they come out. Um, if you've ever been down to the river at this time of year, 
you might have noticed little trails of orange eggs leading to and from uh, the river along the paths. And that likely means that someone caught a female salmon. Um, and then on that note, I wanted to show this little video. Ah, here we go. So this is out in California. I couldn't find a good video here in Wisconsin, but I have seen a lot of scenes just like this. I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit. But if you hang out down at the marinas or um, at places where they pool up in the rivers, you can see him literally jumping out of the water like this. And it really depends on the day. Some days they're jumping a lot, other days they aren't. There's a number of factors that contribute to whether they're jumping or not. But most of these ones that you see belly flopping on the water are females. And they do so to loosen up those eggs that they have inside of them. So it's kind of interesting. A lot of times you can hear them before you see them because they jump so far out of the water and just belly flop down. Um, another interesting distinction is between hatchery and wild fish. So if you pay attention to the fish that are swimming around in the shallows here um, in like the Milwaukee River this time of year, for example, you'll notice that most of them are missing this uh, second fin on their back behind the dorsal fin. We call that the adipose fin. And if you think about what the word adipose means, like adipose tissue is like fatty tissue, right? So um, that fin doesn't really serve a purpose as far as scientists can tell. It's just a, a little knob of um, like fatty flesh that's on the fish. And so the fish hatcheries, before they stock any salmon in Lake Michigan, they um, slice that fin off so that when they do surveys out on the lake and when they're caught, they can tell whether um, the fish that they're seeing are naturally reproducing. If, they're, if they have that adipose fin, that would indicate that they're wild because the hatcheries um, clip it off. And if they don't see it, then that tells them that it's from a hatchery. So that's just um, a management technique that we use. Now, a little bit about the biology of salmon um, in general, is that they're, they're native to the west coast of North America. So think California, um, Alaska, Oregon. And uh, they start their life as eggs in freshwater streams that are then fertilized and they live in um, the gravel for the first few weeks of their life where they then emerge. And eventually they swim out to the Pacific Ocean where they will live for three to five years. And then they return to the exact location in the streams where they were spawned as eggs to spawn eggs of their own. And if they can't reach the exact little patch of stream, they'll get as close as they can. And it's really one of those amazing mysteries of nature as to how they're able to do that. Um, these salmon will um, hatch in Alaska and then swim out to the ocean and literally go all the way to Japan and they'll be able to find their way back to their exact stretch of inland stream. And there's probably a number of ways or um, things that they use to help themselves navigate back. And one of the theories is that they use smell to recognize their natal streams. And another really interesting theory is that they use the iron that's in their blood as a navigational compass. So they can feel the magnetic pull of the earth and they use that as like a GPS. So they're way out in Japan and they know how to get all the way back to Alaska and be able to do it on time for the spawn, which is just amazing. Like how the heck do they do that? Hey Rob. Yeah. Oh, you might be getting this perfectly. Uh, someone has a question about how long they, are they in the egg? form uh is that just for winter or shorter than that but it seems like you're just yeah so oops if i can get back to my presentation here um so here is an overview of their life cycle so um they start off as these eggs and let me actually skip ahead to the next slide real quick and then i'll come back to this so the female salmon this is a video i took on the bender road bridge and you can see two salmon here down at the bottom of the video 
And um, the one on the right is definitely a female. I would assume the one on the left is a male. And you see how it turns to its side there and then slaps its tail on the riverbed. So what it's doing is it's carving out what's called a red. So that is literally just um, like a hole or like a depression in the riverbed where it's using its tail to fan away the smaller pebbles and create spaces in between the bigger rocks. And that's where it'll deposit its eggs. And then the male will come over the red and uh, externally fertilize those eggs. And once they're fertilized, they live in that spot in the red for about six weeks, probably depends on the species. And then they emerge from their eggs as these cute little things, the sac fry. And they stay like that for a few more weeks and they don't emerge from the gravel, they just metabolize that egg yolk that's still attached to them. And so I guess all in all, they live in the gravel for a couple months. Then they emerge from there as what we would call a par. So this is like a baby salmon or trout. They all kind of look like this with these vertical bars on them and they can be really difficult to tell apart at this stage. Um, and then as they get ready to go to the ocean, they lose those vertical bars and they develop this um, mirror appearance that helps them blend in out in the ocean as they swim um, that, that direction. And then they live out in the ocean for a few years and then they start spawning and the cycle continues. Um, I'll show this one more time because it's cool. Isn't that cool? All right, um, whew, let me go back. So uh, the salmon are zombies. Now, what the heck does that mean? So when they're in uh, their spawning stage, they don't eat at all. They just burn all their stored energy. So all their fat that's in, in the meat, they use all that up as energy to get upstream. And they're actually metabolizing as much of their body as they can afford to in order to produce more eggs or sperm if they're a male. So their meat quality really de decreases quick. As soon as they start spawning, they turn from chrome to kind of an olive color brown. And within a month or two, they're like this dark greenish black color and their, their skin gets all weird and wrinkly and um, you'll actually see them starting to decompose before they're, before they're even dead yet. And you'll see a lot of them with this white fungus growing on them just because their immune system starts to shut down and they're so stressed out. And a lot of people refer to fall fishing for salmon, especially later in the season as zombie fishing. So you can see this coho salmon here uh, is exhibiting some zombie-like characteristics, I'd say. And uh, what's really interesting is any body part that the salmon doesn't need, they'll start to digest in order to make more eggs. So they even digest part of their own gut because, I mean, they're just gonna die anyway. They might as well try to make as many eggs and give that next generation the best shot possible. Um, so they're also known as ecosystem engineers. I mentioned that earlier. And one of the reasons is because they change the rivers so much while they're in them. So all that slapping their tails on the riverbeds um, and making reds leads to a lot of bioturbation, which is just a disturbance in the aquatic vegetation, algae plants. And that actually leads to a change in the stream metabolism. So the primary production of the stream decreases quite a bit. There's um, a lower level of oxygen during salmon runs, and they've shown that in a lot of studies, which I think is somewhat ironic because the salmon are so oxygen sensitive and they really need uh, highly oxygenated water. They're also known as ecosystem engineers because they live out in the sea for most of their life and they're just eating tons of fish, growing really big in just a few short years, and they acquire at least 95% of their biomass while they're out at sea, but then they return to, to rivers, freshwater, inland to spawn and then die. So all those nutrients that they acquired while they were out at sea, they then bring those inland and they die and decompose, which really fertilizes the river. 
And they've done studies to show that almost a quarter of the nitrogen that's in riparian trees in their native range has shown to be marine derived, which means that it comes from the ocean. So these salmon are um, conducting one of the biggest nutrient translocations in the natural world, which is really amazing. And they show that, um, you know, the salmon really need um, pristine water to develop. They, they really have, um, they're sensitive to uh, the amount of dissolved oxygen in the water. And so they've shown that there's this mutually beneficial relationship between the salmon and the riparian trees and the larger ecosystem. So the salmon fertilize the trees and just add a lot of organic matter to the ecosystem. And in return, these strong trees help keep the water clean. They help filter out a lot of the sediment and prevent that from going into the river and covering up the eggs, which would um, not allow them to get enough oxygen. So it's another really amazing thing where these salmon kind of sacrifice themselves to be fertilizer so that their kids can survive. So here in the Great Lakes, um, salmon are a pelagic fish, just like they are out in uh, their native range. And pelagic, that word means uh, open water, like not close to the bottom and not close to shore. So that pretty much describes Lake Michigan here. And they really like cold water and they have very specific oxygen requirements, as I mentioned. And those two things kind of go hand in hand as cold water can hold more oxygen than warm water. So they live in Lake Michigan for three to five years and then they migrate upriver to spawn. So they go up the Milwaukee River, the Menominee River, and I assume the Kinnickinnick River too, but I don't do any surveys there, so I can't say for sure. And how did these salmon get here? How did they come all the way from the Pacific Ocean to the Great Lakes? Great question. So it all starts back in the early 1900s when they had this idea to connect the Great Lakes to uh, the ocean. So historically, the upper four Great Lakes, Huron, Michigan, Superior, and Erie, were not connected to the ocean. They were um, separated by Niagara Falls, which is a pretty substantial barrier. I don't know of any fish that would be able to scale that. So um, people had this idea that they could create a canal that goes around Niagara Falls, and that would be this awesome shipping opportunity for Chicago and other port cities in the Great Lakes. Unfortunately, that brought in some invasive species. So the alewife and the sea lamprey. And that was really bad for our native ecosystem. So the sea lamprey, it's not hard to tell how they're bad for our native fish. This is a lake trout here, which historically was the top predator out on the Great Lakes. And uh, these sea lamprey, they, you know, they look like a leech, but they're actually a vertebrate. They're a type of primitive fish um, they predate on the lake trout. And then the alewife, they outcompeted a lot of the native bait fish and provided this um, plentiful food source for the lake trout, which sounds good, right? But they have this chemical in them called thiaminase, which breaks down thiamine, which is something that's needed for egg development in lake trout. So when the lake trout have a diet that's 50% or more alewife, they, their reproductive success is basically zero. And the other reason why alewives were a big problem in Lake Michigan in the early 60s is that they're really temperature sensitive. So at the time, they made up over 90% of the entire biomass of Lake Michigan. And because they're temperature sensitive, right, like Lake Michigan is going to fluctuate more than the ocean, they were subject to large scale die offs. So there's a lot of famous pictures um, back in the 60s of literally plow trucks plowing piles of dead alewives off of the beaches um, in Lake Michigan and property values were plummeting and they had to do something about it because our native top predator, the lake trout was locally extinct or extirpated is the term for that. So they were not around in Lake Michigan. So um, 
this guy, Howard Tanner from the Michigan DNR had the idea to introduce salmon, which eat alewives to control the alewife boom. Now, I know what a lot of you are thinking, you know, introducing one species to control another species usually leads to more problems. And that's usually true, right? Like in Australia, we think about the cane toad and all the damage that it's done over there. But here in Lake Michigan, it actually worked out, and the, the other Great Lakes too, it worked out pretty well. It created this $7.4 billion a year sport fishing industry. So, you know, people historically fished for lake trout, which is cool and fun, but everyone compares reeling in a lake trout to reeling in a log. They don't really fight much, whereas the king salmon are just unbelievably strong and fast, and they fight so hard, and it's, it really created a, a big sport fishing industry that wasn't there before. They're also good for eating and they really helped control the alewife population to the point that now the alewives are diminishing quite a bit. And we'll talk about that a little more. And so they were able to reintroduce lake trout and they have some natural reproduction now. So that's awesome. The whole salmon stocking kind of worked out. However, the alewife population has decreased so much that the number of salmon that we're seeing nowadays is so much less than it used to be. So when I'm out doing my creel surveys, all the old timers tell the same story that up until about 15 years ago, the fishing was great. They all call it the good old days. And if you look at this graph of the um, bait fish populations of Lake Michigan, that's really the last time that there was a decent bait fish population. And the, the real old timers will talk about the 70s and how that was great. So that would have been the early days of salmon introductions in Lake Michigan. And you can tell here that the alewife is this gray color on the graph. They made up almost all the bait fish at the time. And that's pretty much exclusively what the salmon eat. So some of the other salmonids like uh, trout, they um, have a variety of niches. They can hang out at the bottom. They can eat insects. They can eat gobies, right? They can change their diet up. But the salmon are more specific and that they're a pelagic open water fish and they almost exclusively eat the alewives. So this bait fish decline is affecting all the salmonids, but it's effective. It's especially affecting the, um, the Chinook salmon, which is, you know, probably the biggest one that, that people care the most about. So um, I wanna talk a little bit more about uh, salmon in um, Wisconsin rivers. And if you read a lot of the literature, it'll tell you that natural reproduction doesn't happen in Wisconsin, that our streams are too silty for natural reproduction. But you see, I've got that asterisk there and we'll talk a little bit more about that. And so the literature says that you know, we don't have natural reproduction here, yet 60% of the salmon on Lake Michigan are not from fish hatcheries. They're wild. How can that happen if we don't have natural reproduction? Well, Michigan does. Michigan um, has a lot more pristine and clear rivers than we do, thanks to a lot of their national forests and, and other factors over on that side of the lake. So most of the natural reproduction does happen on the Michigan side. But a lot of the anglers say that the fishing is better um, out on the lake, um, closer to the Wisconsin side in the summer. But then the same anglers will complain that the fall fishing kind of drops off over on the Wisconsin side. And so keep in mind that salmon return to the rivers where they hatch to, to then spawn themselves. So if most of the natural reproduction is happening on the Michigan side, it makes sense that um, a lot of those fish would disappear. The wild fish would go back to Michigan in the fall to spawn themselves. But what is it about Wisconsin that makes uh, the fishing great in the summer? Well, if you look at our map of the Great Lakes here, um, the wind often blows from west to east, right? And that is significant because of this thing called thermal stratification. So um, the lake water, and this is true for many bodies of water, it doesn't really mix very well. So there's basically two layers. There's a warm layer up top and then there's a cold layer. And these 
two layers of water have different densities, so they don't mix very well. And so the warm layer is going to be less dense, so that's going to sit on top. So when you have the wind blowing from west to east, that's going to push that warm layer over towards the Michigan side. So they're going to get more warm water. And then this cold water is going to, um, they call it upwelling. It upwells and brings that cold water up on the Wisconsin side. And so that's why um, the fishing is often better over on the Wisconsin side in the summer. So westerly winds bring cold water and fish. A lot of the fishermen, they're always looking for west winds. If they're going fishing and the wind's blowing east, they're not too happy. But, um, so Michigan has warmer beach waters, but because the uh, wind tends to blow across the lake, they get more lake effect snow. So warmer beach waters, not as many fish in the summer, more snow, a bit of a trade-off. So you saw my asterisks when I said that salmon don't naturally reproduce on the uh, Wisconsin side. And this is that little asterisk here. So uh, we were doing some seine netting on Pigeon Creek, which is a tributary of the Wisconsin, or Milwaukee River above the Thienesville Dam. And we found this baby king salmon. And how the heck does that happen? Well, if you think back to last fall, we had so much rain and there was so much flooding. The river was over the East Bank Trail here at Riverside Park. And uh, so a lot of the salmon were able to get over the Clutch Park waterfall, over the Thienesville Dam. And uh, my professor, Dr. Jansen, said that there were dozens of salmon in this tiny little creek in Macklin. And apparently at least two of them were able to successfully reproduce. And um, so we found this little baby uh, salmon par. And uh, so we do see some natural reproduction on the Wisconsin side. There's not a lot of great habitat. The water quality is not great for them, but life finds a way. And I think that's pretty cool. So on to fishing, everybody's favorite part, right? Uh, so you wanna look for water temperatures around 55 degrees, maybe a little cooler, maybe like 52 degrees. That tends to be what the salmon like. Like I said, you wanna look for westerly winds. And if you are gonna go out and try to catch salmon, I recommend a heavy rod and reel because they are unbelievably strong. Um, you're going to need strong line, lots of it. I've many times I've seen someone hook into a king salmon and it takes their line and runs all the way out until there's no line left and then breaks the line. I've seen it happen many, many, many times. Um, and then they start to come in from the lake and hang out in the near shore waters in August, early September. And that's a time when a lot of people catch them trolling from boats. And I know that's not super accessible for everyone. So there are some good uh, shore fishing spots. Um, when they first start coming in, the hot spot is at McKinley Marina, way out at the end of the pier. Guys are just trying to get as close to um, the, the middle of the lake as they can. And during this time, I pretty much exclusively see people catch them on spoons. And uh, I'll give you a little, little tip here. Gold spoons work the best, gold and orange. Um, and then later on in the run, once they really start spawning and their eggs start getting loose, the tactics to catch them change. So a lot of people use um, skein. I know that was a word that was in our lecture last week, I think for uh, the term for a group of flying geese, but it's also the term for the membrane that holds the uh, salmon's eggs inside of their body. So people use that for bait and that and spawn sacks, which is just a sack of um, loose salmon eggs or trout eggs. Those are probably the two things that um, I see the most. And then you're also like the salmon, they're not eating, right? So it's really different than fishing for bass or panfish, which is what I grew up fishing for. You know, like if you're fishing for bass and you're seeing them jumping and feeding everywhere and you cast in that direction, you have a pretty good chance of catching a fish. With salmon, that's really not the case. And for that reason, they can be pretty frustrating to fish for because you can see them, but not catch them. 
And since they're not feeding, a lot of times what you're trying to do is trigger those aggression strikes, right? So you're really just trying to annoy the fish to the point that it bites your hook. So people use a lot of baits that have like rattles or a glow, or they're just really loud in some way. And a lot of times, if you see the salmon around the red, especially the males will, um, you know, if you're using a bait that looks like a fish, like a crankbait or a jerkbait, for example, they'll charge after it and just to protect their reds. Um, inline spinners, jigs, just anything that really annoys the fish will work. But if you really want to catch salmon, especially from shore, I highly recommend you get into fly fishing because the fly fishermen catch more salmon than anyone else by far. Um, oh, and then definitely the way you don't want to catch them is by snagging. So snagging is where you intentionally hook the fish somewhere other than their mouth. And unfortunately, we do see some of this. It can be pretty tempting when you see tons of fish to just try to throw your hook in there and catch one by the tail. Um, but that's illegal and also highly unethical. So don't do that. Um, call 1-800-TIP-DNR if you see that. Tip WDNR. Um, if you do accidentally snag a fish, which does happen because there's so many of them in the river, it's just a surface area question at that point that eventually it's going to happen. You should try to get it off the hook as quickly as possible without taking it out of the water. And even if the fish does die in the process of being snagged, you still have to return it to the river um, because it's, it's illegal. And even if it's dead, you know, you might be inclined to say, well, it's dead anyway, I might as well take it home for the meat. Well, then everyone would just do that. And that's not fair, not ethical. So, uh, if you're going to keep a fish, it has to be caught by the mouth. And then to end this presentation, I just wanted to show some of the cool places to fish around Milwaukee. So Estabrook Park, there is a little um, waterfall. It's really fun to watch them jump the falls. They get over this one a little bit uh, easier than they do at Clutch Park. Another great place to fish. You can really see them uh, swimming along the ripple, ripples here. Clutch Park, like we already talked about. And then McKinley Marina, I highlighted some of the fishing hotspots here. So when they first start coming in in like late August, early September, the place you want to be is way out here at the end of the pier. But then as they get closer to their run, and even now you can see them around here at the boat ramps, but they are very plentiful in the marina. So just about anywhere is going to be a good spot. And then here's some more places to fish. So just about anywhere on the rivers, um, typically anywhere that you're seeing salmon is going to be a good place to fish. Um, bottlenecks in the river, so places where it's really shallow, where they'll pool up, you know, that's going to give you the best chance. And those are my references, so I guess now we can open it up for questions.